Now, good evening. Hi, Hi Bridget, how are you? Hi, good. Now, so you are all very welcome. So thank you everyone for joining us for this evening's 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum. So um, we're joined here this evening by journalist, um, historian and longtime friend and supporter of the Little Museum, Bridget Hurricane. Bridget, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Great to be here, Sarah. And I'm delighted. So over the course of the evening, we're going to be hosting a wine tasting. Um, but I guess just to set us off and kind of jump into the um, to jump into the evening. Bridget, you've hosted or you've you've spoken at a couple of the Dublin lectures that we've hosted here in the past in the Little Museum. And I know that your subject matter for the evenings was uh, James Clarence Mangan. And Mangan would have been a poet who I, I dare to say maybe some of us are not as familiar with as we could be or we should be. And I wonder if you might kind of start us off for the evening by telling us a story about who he is. Who he is. Uh, well, actually, who he is, you have put your finger in a way on one of the things he is, which is that um, he is he is very unknown. So when you say we don't really know about him, that's actually part of his myth. Uh, he called himself the man in the cloak, the nameless one. And even every book or lecture on him starts by saying how neglected he is, how unknown he is. And this was happening even when he was actually a household name. There was still this trope of being completely, uh, completely unknown. So that is, is, is all part of his myth. And actually that's one of the things that attracted me to him. He is extremely enigmatic. He's purposely enigmatic. He's also just by virtue of the time he lived in, uh, he lived at a period in Dublin where there are less records than for periods I would say either before or since. So there's not a lot of material on him. Um, so he is, he, he's enigmatic. Uh, now I should tell you something more about him. I just keep saying how unknown he is. Uh, the other thing I guess that I like about him is I think he is, I like the romantic poets, you know, Shelley, Byron, uh, Baudelaire in, in Paris, Edgar Allan Poe in America, these romantics who are interested in, they write kind of melancholy death, nature, uh, unrequited love. Now he is he is a true romantic. I think he's the only, probably, the only poet we have is a true romantic by his date. He's, he's born in 1803 and he dies in 1849. We've got almost exactly the same dates as, Baudel as Edgar Allan Poe and just a little bit, he's a little bit older than Baudelaire. Uh, so he's, 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 he's in the romantic period time. He's also, uh, which he's the romantics were all about the life had to mirror the art and that's actually in a way is what we've inherited from them but now you see it more in rock stars than in poets the rock stars are the inheritors of it's not enough to just write a poem before the romantics there was much less interest in people's biography and in the way they led their lives after the romantics and from the romantics onwards there is this huge focus on the life and that's what happens with Mangan and I think it was deliberate. I think he understood quite well that he needed to become a myth, which is what he did. He did it by being, as I say, enigmatic. He did it by, uh, he was very uh, strangely attired. He had a very particular look. He calls himself the man in the cloak because he wore a cloak over a coat with a very kind of, uh, large steeple hat. He was he was one of these figures which I think he still had in Dublin until recently, maybe now a bit less, but he was a Dublin character and it was he was kind of gesturing to the dandy. The dandy was a very Byronic concept which would not put up, but it was the dandy as Trump. And he was then so this was this this was a romantic look. He then was he was a very bad addict. He was an alcoholic, he was an opium addict again that it would be a romantic thing that you go all the way that you end up dying uh, in a gutter which I'm afraid is what he did. Uh, so all of that uh, just makes him I extremely compelling and I'm sorry I've now spoken all about him which is not right. His work is also uh, endlessly mystifying and fascinating. He 
it kind of makes it sound like in his time, the poets were the rock stars of today and really in your description of it there. Absolutely, absolutely. There wasn't, um, I mean, there must have been folk musicians, but they somehow didn't get the same degree of attention. Poets got, and that's, I think, it's very much thanks. Well, it's thanks to Wordsworth went off to the Lake District and created this, what we would call Bohemian household around him. And then Byron had an extremely, even by today's standards, you know, I mean, Byron slept with his sister, like this is not, uh, and he was a lord, he had a club foot, uh, he went all around the Mediterranean. They all died young, which Mangan did as well. It's almost part of the uh, description. So I would say, I mean, if you study the romantics and you look then at rock stars, you know, you look at Doherty, you look at even, even David Bowie, it is so similar. It is an absolutely, there has to be a look and there has to be an excess of behavior and there has to be, we are not part of bourgeois life. And he had, Bangan had that naturally. I mean, he was not, he was born into poverty really. Uh, but it's this idea of starving for your art in a gutter that was admirable to them. And he was very much admired for his intensity, if not quite understood. Okay, it's a, it, it's a, it's a kind of an analogy I've never thought of before. And it's fascinating. And I kind of, actually, I just see Emily joining us. So I'm just going to take a moment and just say, um, this is Emily Falconer, who is the chief winemaker with Carmen. So thank you also for joining us this evening. How are you? Hi, thank you for having me. Sorry, it was a few minutes late. Technology no. was taking over with me, but here we are. <laughs> I've never done that, but you're very welcome. Um, so myself and Bridget were jumping into a couple of stories originally. She was telling us about a perhaps slightly lesser known Irish poet. And I guess we'll come back to speaking about Manga now in a moment. But Emily, you might just kind of set us up for the wine that we're tasting this evening. Um, I I'm going to be up front and say, so it's the Carmen Grand Reserve and the grape that we're tasting is a Carrigan. And I'm going to, I possibly pronounced that wrong. And it's actually, it's a grape I'm not familiar with at all. No, you're I'm not. Honest. Yes, it's a Garignan. Um, it's a grape that came into Chile in the early 90s, like in 1939, and it came from the south of France. Um, but it's originally from Spain. In Spain, they call it Garinera. Um, and it comes from, from a dry farming area in, in, in Chile, like 400 kilometers south from the capital in, in a region called Maule. And it's a very local, rural type of viticulture. Um, so that's why I think why we, we chose it. It has a big sort of heritage value for the Chilean viticulture. Um, and it's a very raw, pure type of a work they do in these vineyards. They're head trained, um, very low intervention in the, in the, in the winemaking. Um, so we try to keep like this image that we, we see in this place. Um, and it's, I don't know, we thought it would probably be interesting for you, for you all to taste in this context. Absolutely. And so in tasting it, what sort of flavours are we looking for? What sort of... Um, so normally getting it, well, why the, it came in so big uh, at that time in Chile was because in Chile we used to have a mission grape. It, it's called, um, brought by the Spaniards in the early 1500s. And that was basically what we had until 1800s when French varieties came in. Um, and this mission grape, we call it Pais. Um, it's a very low colored grape and very low acidity. Mm. So Garignan is the complete opposite. It's a very intense in color, very aromatic, uh, and has very good acidity. So they started planting it a lot in the South of Chile to blend in with this mission grape and improve the, the quality and the character of the, the mission grape and the, the wines that we were having in Chile. So that's why uh, you see it's a very intense in color and a very savory type of wine. It's very uh, towards uh, red fruit, like, um, how do you say in English? There's a, um, I have, have blank, that little red fruit uh, oh. that you make jelly with to- Red carrot? Uh, red carrot, yeah, that one. <laughs> red carrot, um, I don't know, cherry, uh, 
and then also some herbal notes. Um, so yes, uh, it's a very expressive wine and it's a very, uh, we, we don't do much to it in the winery. We age it in old oak, um, so we, we don't have a big impact on wood flavors. So it's a very fruit driven character. And due to the high acidity it has, it, it ages very well in time. Acidity gives wines a lot of life. Um, so it's quite a vibrant uh, grape. Okay. Yeah. And in that aging well, so say I've got a 2018 vintage in front of me, how many years do I have to drink that? Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, I don't know, the Garignan can live for many, many years in a bottle. Uh, I don't know. So it's a very difficult question and people are always very intrigued by how long a bottle of wine can last. But uh, I always say they should taste a bottle a year and then get back to me and tell me. Because there's a curve uh, where the wine changes in the bottle and it goes uh, evolving, changing it aromatically in colour, um, the, the palate, the sensation. and and it arrives to like its peak and then it starts fading away. That peak could be depending, I, getting in, I would say 15 years, 10 years easily, um, but it could be more, could be less. And it doesn't mean that 15 years is the peak and then it's dead. Um, it doesn't happen that way. A lot of people write to me, I get on social media questions. I found a 1989 bottle of wine. Is it going to be, a harmful for, for me to drink it and I'm like no go ahead maybe it's not going to be that great or maybe it's going to be fantastic but it's difficult to know. Mm. Uh, but yeah. is, it, it, is it the case Emily that wines do have a they have a past the sell-by date like if you say 20-25 years that's probably too long for most wines or um I think wines have an objective when we make them and some wines are thought to be drunk straight away and some wines are thought to age a long time. There's also types of, uh, of grapes that have a, a big aging potential like I don't know for example the, the oldest wine I've ever had is from 1902 wow. uh, from Madeira in Portugal and those wines are, are ridiculously ridiculous how long they can age and live in the bottle and, it uh, and, and be fantastic very okay. good and some like wines it hasn't got very it's fortified it's okay okay yeah. it's fortified it's a, like a port type wine um but if not a few weeks ago i had a, a 1950 something rioja 1956 i think it was uh rioja and it was fantastic uh, great. So it's sort of difficult to say 20 years, 25. Mm. Uh, I don't know. I've had some semillons from Australia that are 20 years old and, and they taste, and I've done blame tastings with friends and they guess the vintage and they say 2015 um, and it's 20 years old and they think wow. it's four years old. Wow. Um, so it depends on the grape variety and how you made it. Uh, mm. So going back to this wine, I think Garignan has a very good age potential. Okay, and I think kind of there's something really interesting about that, that it is actually, there's an element of kind of subjectivity to it, but also the kind of the aging and the way that it will evolve, whether it's designed for kind of short-term consumption or the more longer term. Like I know, I, I read an article that you wrote there a couple of weeks ago, and you mentioned this idea that when you're producing a bottle of wine, you're really thinking about the end user you're thinking about who's actually going to sit down and enjoy it and what environment that's going to happen in like could you take us through that thought process and maybe either use tonight's wine or another wine as an example to tell us what that's like as an experience well for, uh, for example with a Garignan I'm a, I'm a big Garignan fan especially because of the way uh, what it what it tells you in, in the Chilean sort of viticulture sort of history so uh, I think two things when with this wine. Um, this is an old vine a wine from a really sort of special place with a very linked to the culture of the place. So I think it has a value of telling a story of a specific site. Mm. Um, so people that are interested in not only like the mainstream type of wines and they want something different from a place, this, that's what I'm thinking in 
because it's in our Grand Reserve range where we make uh, 10 different wines. So between Cab, uh, Carmener, Syrah, Merlot, single uh, variety wines. And Garignan is sort of like the black sheep among that, uh, that range of wines. And I'm thinking if uh, people that want to sort of be a little bit more adventurous and taste something different. And in terms of the wine profile, I think it has to sort of back that up. Mm. Um, for it to be sort of expressive, savory, easy drinking. Always in, in Gran Reserva, we're, we're, we're thinking in a wine that is ready to drink when the person buys it. Um, here, I'm not, I'm not thinking of a wine that they buy it and they have to age it. No, it's a wine to enjoy, to get to know Chile, because we make these 10 different wines from different sites in Chile. Um, so to have a little bit of, a, of the experience of the diversity and the possibilities that we have in terms of wine making and of viticulture here. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but, yeah. no. <laughs> but I think a lot of things, I, it doesn't mean that the consumer has always has to be in, in line with what I'm thinking when we're making the, the wines, but, um, no, but I think least, yeah, the main goal is for them to enjoy. Uh, and I think this idea of kind of capturing a sense of place is a really special thing. Like, um, I think actually talking about this idea of place, kind of Bridget, going back to um, Mangan, who we were talking about a few minutes ago, you know, obviously the Dublin he would have lived in would be quite different to the world surrounding us today. I, could you paint us a picture of what the city would have been like and what his environment would have been like at that time? Uh, I will, absolutely. I just, can I just quickly answer a question uh, which I saw come up from yeah. Patricia in Donegal. Just sorry, just because it's extremely well, relevant to what Emily was saying and uh, I would like Emily's help on this. It's a very good question. She said, is there any, I think the question is, is there any particular evidence that wine fires the creative juices? Nah. Which is, I think, a good question to ask a sommelier and uh, a, a literary critic so I would say there is, I don't know if this evidence is empirical, but there is an astonishing amount of uh, anecdotal circumstantial evidence because there is a huge link. There is, let's say, I don't know if it's a link, but a lot of literary musical geniuses were uh, extremely, uh, let's say, big drinkers and also drug takers and that goes all the way back and you could name hundreds. In fact, it's more difficult, I would say, uh, at least in the Western canon, to name the ones who didn't drink a lot. I mean, it's just massive. Uh, um, obviously, Mangan, uh, now he didn't drink wine. I don't think there was a lot of wine in Dublin in, in the early 19th century. He drank something called tar water. I have no idea. I imagine it was some relation of Cochin. Uh, he was drinking that and he was taking opium. Uh, but all of then you've obviously Keats, a beaker of the warm south. So he was getting wine, but he had to go to Italy to get wine. But all the way up to the present day, anyway, what I'm saying is there is this huge link. But whether, I just don't know if that's proof, would they have been as good without the wine? Were they taking wine because uh, that was a model of behavior? I mean, the only example, the only one I can think of at the moment of someone, the crime writer Stephen King, was um he was a huge drinker i mean he said he used to or go through the horror writer i should say as well as more horror than crime i think he drank at least a bottle and he said he had this huge link between writing and drinking he could not write if he didn't drink and i have come across a lot of people who say that so once you've set up a routine with your writing some people have it with coffee Martin Amos had it with tennis which is obviously healthier he couldn't write until he had wrecked himself Stephen King had this and then he had to give up because he got so bad he had to give up and he continued writing his output is I think as prolific and probably as good as ever so he survived this uh, others you'd have to say didn't a lot of rock stars you can point to you'd have to say their best work was done in the middle of addiction but that could be the relationship with youth but maybe we'll ask Emily does she have any is there anything in wine that could uh, release creative juices. Release creative juices? Make you more creative. Uh, oh, well, I think alcohol writing. in general can, but it, uh, to a certain extent it can go the other way. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, yes, the, I think it, it does. One gets a little bit inspired or a little bit 
uh, I think you you free yourself from judgment, uh, and I think uh, pre pre judgment. No, is that a word pre? Yes, to some judgment that is sort of released with with alcohol. I don't know if it's uh, mainly related to just to wine. Uh, no, exactly. It's it probably all <laughs> alcohol. You lose your inhibition. Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, that's a fascinating question though Patricia I think your your idea that ritual probably is part of it uh, Bridget kind of would really very much kind of ring through true as well that you could you could very much see that and I think that was a great question if anyone has more questions please do pop them in and we will kind of come through some of them as we go over the evening and um, so Bridget I'm going to come back to you now um, back on Dublin yes so that is one of the things that I suppose is very compelling to me about Mangan is that he is, uh, I would say he is the most Dublin writer we have and it's, you can get more specific than saying Dublin, it's, it's liberties. He was born on Fishamble Street in, uh, the site is now actually Lord Edward Street because Fishamble Street was kind of carved up in the late 19th century. But he was born there and then he died on Bright, or he didn't die, he was picked up dying on Bright Street, which is just down the road from Fishamble Street. And between those two dates, 1803 and 1849, he was always moving house. He had no money. He was what he called peripathetic. Um, and he lived, I would say, at least 25 addresses, but all of them are in this tiny area, uh, almost all in the Liberties. I think once he crossed the river and lived across the river, otherwise it's the Liberties. He worked in the center of town. He worked as a legal clerk. He contributed to journals and he worked also in Trinity College Library, all in the centre of town. So I plotted out his beat, if you like, on a map. And uh, it's it's just this very constricted area. And if you are a Dubliner yourself, when you look at that, you almost feel claustrophobic because he just about never left. When he was a young man, he would go for rambles up as far as Rathbarnham. But and when he was a child, he had relatives in Meath. I think he, he got to Meath, but otherwise this was, he almost never left. And uh, the, he's so Dublin, at the same time, he never writes about it. So he, I think in one poem, he references it, maybe two, in two short stories, in one essay, and in, there's a fragment of autobiography, which is quite fascinating. Obviously he talks about it there, but otherwise, he wrote almost a thousand poems and they are not set in Dublin. They are set in, in, in Germany, in, in Persia, in this kind of mythical East, which he loved to imagine this exotic place in France. And also then in 17th century Ireland, he translated a lot of Gaelic poems. But his mind was constantly leaving the present and what was in front of them. So he's, he, he, he's the opposite, the direct opposite to Joyce. He was a big influence on Joyce. Joyce loved him, but Joyce left Dublin and never wrote about anything else. Mangan stayed and never wrote about it. And artistically, it's fascinating, but uh, from a historian's point of view, it can be frustrating because the time he lived at is actually, it's a, quite a shadowy time. It's difficult to get an angle on the spirit of the age, much less so than say 30, if the generation before him, there are much more journals, there are much more memoirs, there are much more diaries. We have a much better sense of Dublin in the 1780s and 90s when it was a very vibrant city. In the first three decades of the, 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 the 19th century, so the first three decades of Mangan's life, we just have so little sense of Dublin because uh, really after the Act of Union and after all the rebellions, um, there was the Wolf Turn, there was 1796, there was 1798, and there was Robert Emmett. The authorities became extremely uh, afraid of insurrection and they closed down everything. At the same time, the Act of Union in the end had a devastating economic uh, impact on Dublin, there was no protection left for anything and the entire uh, magazine and journal trade, which had been huge, was devastated. So there was no journals there and people, writers left, most writers, and that's what, that's actually the beginning, maybe what we call drain, brain drain, writers went to London because they couldn't make a career in Dublin. So we just don't know what it was like and it's really frustrating because there was Mangan and he, 
he, he, he lived on the streets. He was not sitting at home in his office. He was going from pub to pub and he could have told us uh, and he didn't. And the other thing, sorry, and I will uh, get let's, but the other thing that's frustrating is we also don't really know what it looked like because mm. the Liberties, which was a really old part of Dublin, um, it's completely gone. The Liberties he saw, first of all, it was redone. The Guinnesses did this big kind of uh, uh, very altruistic civic thing where they brought in, if you know, the red brick around the Ivy Markets, around mm. John Dillon Street. This was all Guinness stuff because by that stage, the Liberties was tenement. So they remade it. And then in the 1970s, right through to the 90s, you had property developers who just took it down. So actually, I've, I've researched, I've looked at it. The Liberties must have looked quite like Amsterdam. There was a lot of Dutch Phillies. There was a lot of the French Huguenots came over. It was the center of the weaving trade. And it was early Georgian buildings. Now, early Georgian, I think, was less solidly built than, say, uh, the Georgian squares, Marion Square, but it was similar. The photo of the house Mangan was born in, which was brought down in 1970. It's a very elegant kind of thin house. Um, so it, it, it was similar. It, it had a, I think it must have looked extremely gothic and wow. It must have looked amazing, but nobody took any sketches of it. Of course, there were no photos. We have a few photos from the late 19th century, which get a little bit of it, uh, but it's it it is kind of an absence it's an absence architecturally and it's an absence in the written uh in in what's written so again it, it's part of his enigma and he didn't tell us okay which is which is fascinating because if am i right in thinking that the majority or the not necessarily the majority but a lot of the work that mangan is particularly well known for would be talking about the famine which is obviously going on at this time in history and that he's kind of speaking about things as you're saying that maybe are not happening on his doorstep at that moment he, he never it's again um it's fascinating he was true to his artistic self he never actually mentions the famine he never he's famous as a famine poet for good reason he is i think the only person who managed to artistically uh, express the devastation of the famine in a number of poems but he would he didn't write about it he does it through he translated Gaelic poems from the 17th century which are very devastating poems because that was uh, the Tudor, that was after the Tudor plantation the Cromwellian plantation it's the complete destructive of the Gaelic order now he found these poems and by translating them he's making a commentary on uh, what's happening in the 1840s and then he also he has an amazing poem called Siberia, which is a, about prisoners of war in Siberia who are so cold. And that's the thing with the famine. People are so cold as well as hungry. And as soon as you read it, you 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 think of the famine and everyone who read it. He published that in The Nation, which was an incredibly uh, popular newspaper. It's estimated to have had a million readers. So he published this poem. Everybody knew it was the famine, but he didn't he just didn't mention it and it was an amazing decision by his because other poets were writing about the famine and it's what they tried to do was never successful because it, to write about something so devastating is almost impossible uh and their attempt at trying to describe you know starving children and it just doesn't work because it's too large and i think he had in a way what would become a modern sensibility i mean i think you have it after adorno after the holocaust you know you cannot write poetry about something so dreadful uh and he just instinctively knew that and it was the way he developed anyway so he sidesteps it yeah he, he definitely he sounds like um he sounds like a character that's worth us collectively kind of bringing him slightly more to the fore i know myself i might make make a point of buying one or two poetry books and learn a little bit more so if that's the good thing that comes away from this evening um i actually i might just look and see if we have any questions on the go here at the moment um we have one gentleman that's got a question for emily here and um, he's wondering the name carmen does that come from the word carmenere the wine the grape well um, there's a little bit of a coincidence there because carmenere well Carmenere is a very old French 
grape variety that disappeared in the late 1800s from Europe after the phylloxera plague that um, basically vanished most of the vineyards in, in Europe and then were replanted, but they never replanted with Carmenere. And Carmenere had arrived to Chile uh, just a little bit before uh, that happened in Europe, but we never knew we had it until 1994. We used to think it was a, we had it sort of a little bit confused with Merlot. So, um, so it was rediscovered in Carmen in 1994. Oh. Carmen was a, founded in 1850, so it's not because of Carmen. Er. A, Carmen is the name of the founder's wife. Christian Lanz founded a Carmen. It's actually the first winery to be founded in in Chile, so I feel a little bit uh, bad because all this history you're talking about goes so way back and we feel so proud about being the first winery being established only in 1850, but anyway, for New World that's uh, pretty old. Very much um, so. And his wife was called Carmen, so it's a little bit of a coincidence of words, Carmen and Carmenere being this very emblematic grape in Chile, being rediscovered in Carmen, but it's just a, a name coincidence. Okay, that's that's a pretty lovely coincidence as far as they go. Um, yes. And I do. I, I see another question here. Um, wondering that, um, do different grape varieties um, to produce red wine, are they picked at different times and do different um, grape varieties need longer times to mature? Well, it's a good question. Yes, the question is yes. I think, well, um, picking date is a very, very, very important day decision. It's a, a, a decision made by the winemaker and it, it has a lot to do with the style of wine you're going to do. Um, some, it's like, it's like when you're standing under a cherry tree and you have to pick the cherry that you want to eat. Uh, some people go for the very ripe, juicy, almost soft cherries um, and some people go to the only just ripe and savory, fresh uh, sort of more acid type and and in wine it's exactly the same thing you you decide when to pick your grapes and that's going to define what type of wine you're going to get and then when you open that decision to different grape varieties um, we have uh, some grape varieties that have a long cycle to ripen and some have a shorter cycle to ripen um, and there's where the decision why some grapes do well in a cooler climate why some grapes do well in a warmer climate that um, for example, going back to Carmenere, Carmenere is a very long cycle grape variety. Carmenere needs a, it's the last grape variety to be picked. Carignan, um, it depends also where it's planted, but um, it has a different day uh, picking, um, it has a different picking date, for example, to Carmenere. Normally it starts with Pinot Noir, Merlot, Malbec, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc. Carignan, Carmenere. <laughs> so more or less like that. And also it depends on uh, what latitude you're at. If you're further north, it's going to ripen earlier. Here, over here in Chile, for you it's going to be the opposite. Mm. Um, further south, it's going to ripen later because it's colder. So okay. we make wine in a, in a range of 800 kilometers from north to south. I don't know how familiar you are all are. The 45 people that are connected with Chile, but it's a very, very long country. It has a little bit over 4,000 kilometers long, very narrow. So we have about 150 kilometers from east to west. So most of our differences are from north to south, but also being between the Andes Mountains, a very high mountain range and the Pacific Ocean, that is a very cold from east to west in very short distances, we have very different climates mm. due to altitude and the impact of the ocean. And that allows us to produce very different uh, grapes. So we have a very long harvest because we make a lot of, a little bit of everything. So we start at the end of January with sparkling wine and finish at the end of April with get minute. Okay, it's, yeah, it, it's fascinating, I think, one thing that I has really been, been becoming clear to me over the past number of sessions that we've had of the kind of the different wine tastings is this idea that, you know, it's not as simple as a, 
a wine from Chile, a wine from Argentina, that because you're dealing with so, such large spaces, so many great varieties, there is such a multitude of different tastes and profiles within each of the areas. And I see a gentleman asked a question here that um, kind of, I, I think is kind of reflective of something I asked yourself earlier this week is, you know, it is that question of you walk into your local supermarket or your local wine merchant and you're met with this huge wall with so many choices, so many wines, so many different brands to, I guess, consider and to choose from. Like, if you're approaching wanting to try something new or wanting to try a wine you're not familiar with, how would you recommend someone goes about that? What should we be looking out for? Well, I think depending on how much knowledge you have about wine, which it, there's no right or wrong, eh, or there's no good or bad, eh, I think the first question is what type of wine you want to drink. And that's a very simple question. First thing would be white or red, sweet or fortified or sparkling. Eh, and then you more or less have an idea of where you have to go. Um, I think new world and old world is also a question. Eh, not meaning that one is better than the other, but there are certain styles that, uh, that have a difference between new world and old world. And then if you, you can go uh, from very broad to very specific for what country, if you decide Chile that you should, uh, you go for the Chilean, and then in Chile you, you can ask yourself, do we want to have a cool climate wine? It would probably be a, fresher, lighter type of wine, or do I want to go for a warm climate and then maybe go by regions or great varieties. I think it depends more or less what, what you know. It d doesn't mean it has to be complicated, but uh, what you know and that way you go sort of getting more specific to get to your bottle of wine. Mm. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, it's a very, very broad question, but yeah. Very, and, and Emily, how much is, uh, is price a helpful indicator? I mean, obviously it is a sphere, uh, but is it the case, you know, is, is, there, a, is there a perfect price, what they call in, in France, rapport prix qualité, where the price meets the quality and maybe over and above that? Yeah, I think price is relevant in terms of telling you above a certain price, you can probably expect it to be more focused uh, production, a uh, more specific type of, or a more um, quality driven type of wine. And, not, and ov obviously there's also a roof above a certain price. How much more quality can you gain? Mm -hmm. I mean, and what, what do you think? I suppose it depends in the country because wine prices. Yes, but uh, I don't know. It's a difficult question yeah. because I, yeah. um, I think it depends again what you're looking for, but I think over well, you're in euros. Uh, we're in euros, and we have very expensive wines in Ireland. But we yeah, have that's why I think yeah, it's probably over twelve uh, or fourteen euros. You're probably sort of going a little bit more specific, yeah. but then over eighty, right? Uh, euros i don't know how much better can it get right um i think it's more there you're sort of really digging into uh, people that are very sort of fanatic uh, and that are interested in to taste like the hand of a certain person or the uh, a certain uh, domain or, or winery uh, yeah. or you want to taste a specific vineyard if you go to burgundy you want to taste a specific uh, parcel or you know uh, or a grand cru or a Bremet cru it's sort of going up and up and up depending how much interest you have so if to enjoy it um, i think there's not so many rules and and the price doesn't have to necessarily get too high Mm, I, I think uh, curiosity and to experiment is definitely the, um, the, the thing to take away from it. Um, I think, Bridget, I'm going to just kind of come back to um, this whole kind of, when we were finishing talking about Mangan a moment ago, we were kind of talking about during times of struggle. And I know when we were speaking earlier this week, you were talking to me a little bit about this idea of continuity of behaviours 
during pandemics and you know obviously it's a little bit too topical at the moment that we <laughs> find ourselves in um one of those particular moments and um i think when you're looking at pandemics throughout history i'm wondering if there is any continuities that you've yeah seen. yeah it's a very it's i think it's one of those things what brought home to me was that you you read about something but it's actually difficult to access it and let until you experience it because for instance the famine people died of disease really they died and they died of typhoid they died of cholera they died of what they call relapsing fever and much more i mean the the, the diseases carried them off before malnutrition did because they would get weakened and then also there was a lot of people in workhouses which spreads diseases so i knew that um kind of intellectually and abstractly but then it was fascinating to live through what is i guess the greatest biggest pandemic since the spanish flu which took us all out of nowhere and it happened that i was writing uh when we went into lockdown i happened to be writing the chapter on mangling famine so that was a brilliant coincidence because i suddenly realized that there was huge similarities and what struck me was that he his very famous poems uh, about the famine are written in a short period in spring summer 1846 and at that time the famine had not reached dublin the famine was in 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 the countryside it had not it got to dublin by 1848 but his experience of the famine was at that stage i mean obviously he was in much more difficult circumstances than we are i don't want to compare my comfortable lockdown to him but it was it what what, what struck me was that we were reading about a terrible pandemic we were not really seeing it unless we were uh going into hospitals obviously front care medical frontline medical workers were but the rest of us were reading about it and we were seeing terrible images from italy in particular but we didn't necessarily know a lot of people who had it we weren't people were not in front of us having it but we were full of dread and we were full of dread because of the news and that was so similar. Now, obviously, our news was mostly uh, through screens, through through television, through social media. His was through newspapers, but it was it, it was strikingly similar. In this, and in the same way, you have all different voices. Uh, so we could choose whether to believe the fear mongers or the uh, people who were saying this is ridiculous and we don't really need to be in lockdown. And it was, it, I, I think choose is the correct word because there was competing voices and it was extremely hard to know because, and we still don't know actually, because a crisis is so, it takes you uh, out of nowhere and you don't have something to compare it to, but it was very similar. He could, there were people, there was someone, I think it was a paper in Limerick maybe as early as autumn 1845, he said, this is a disaster. And then there were other articles saying this is just a normal regional, it, this is not going to, this blight, sorry, when I say it, what I mean is the failure of the potato blight. Somebody called it early, he said this is going to wreck the country, and most people were poo pooing it. So in that way, I just realized this was the people in Dublin in, in 1845, 1846, before it got a stranglehold on the country were like us now i don't think we're going to have the disastrous outcome they had but it is it's that was striking the way you get news was striking but it's still similar and the other thing um the other thing that was striking what was i going to say the statistics no sorry yeah i know one of the kind of one of the themes that i'm taking away from what you're saying there is this idea that communication is really or the kind of the methods of communication and the resources available to us are going to largely influence our perception of it and um kind of on this idea of communication i feel from my own perspective we've been having a lot of perhaps deeper or more meaningful drawn out conversations with friends family and loved ones in the months of the lockdown and i it, it kind of had me thinking about you wrote or you edited i should say a collection of love letters um there with Gil and Mac, I think it was a couple of years ago. And I, I guess having spent time with this subject of love letters, I wonder if there is such a thing as, you know, love in a time of COVID or what you can take from the past to speak about the day. To speak about well, 
yeah um what i what i found in uh with love letters is that and you're right to draw the the, the, the parallel with the pandemic because the love letters seem to me to be very conditional and it depend on circumstances so we tend to to think of um you know the way we love doesn't change i don't think i don't think that changes at all i think human emotion i I, I don't I don't see I think if you look across history it's always there the way they communicate that emotion is actually is so much to do as you say with the means of communication so there is a number of factors I found if you look at the explosion certain periods of history you suddenly get an explosion in love letters uh, one of them would be as simple as the postal service so you don't have a lot of medieval love letters because paper was extremely rare and to send them i don't know did they use carrier pigeons i don't know but it was it just so it was difficult how did you write to your lover uh also obviously there were much less educated people so i'd say the 18th century you start getting a lot of love letters that's was women were at that stage more educated at least aristocratic women and also you have a postal service so that would be one and then uh you suddenly get a, another huge explosion of love letters was um at the end of the 19th century uh i would say that is the golden age because at that stage in dublin you had i think three or four or five posts a day so you we have letters from from james joyce and nora barnacle and hannah sheehy and frank skeffington and that's like reading a kind of email correspondence because frank would write to hannah by the first post and she'd write back and it, we can see them it's very moving that whole relationship they work it out on the page and that's kind of astonishing and it was they did it because they could and then suddenly there are almost very few love letters in the 20th century because of the invention of the telephone so the only love letters i could find there was if people were separated from each other if someone was in america and someone was in dublin you will you will get a correspondence uh but there's if people are in the same country they're just going to phone each other um and in fact what happened then was interesting you know when i was writing the book everyone said oh that's in the past nobody writes to each other anymore uh but in fact i found email again because it was free because it was easy that actually awoke a this 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 need to express yourself in writing and there is now i only know this anecdotally because historically we haven't collected all these emails and i don't know how they will be preserved i mean it's important to preserve things for the archive. I don't really trust the cloud, and the early emails aren't in the cloud anyway. But I don't know in 50 years' time whether people how how we're going to get these emails. But I just know anecdotally that people did start writing to each other, and there is something very different about writing to speaking on the phone to expressing your love. So that was a big thing in email. Then I think, I, my impression is it then went down because of Instagram and I just, I think people, I don't know because I'm not, I can't say I'm sending uh, images, but I think that that is what people are doing. But I do think, as you say, I think during the pandemic, uh, people began to write. I got much more emails from friends, so it's not love letters, it's written correspondence. But actually people did sit down to say what it was like. And that was, and again, it, it's always circumstantial. It's because they couldn't meet. It's because they probably had more time because their time was less taken up. And also they felt the need. And maybe that's what it is that you, if something powerful is happening, you, you, you feel the need. And uh, if you can do it, you do. So I know that, um, for instance, Trinity is now archiving the pandemic and they've asked their alumni to send them um their thoughts and actually they said please do this as, not just their thoughts their observations so obviously there's thousands of alumni all over the world observations on what's happening around them and they said please do this now because you will forget Absolutely. and that's and that's completely and i'm sure for the little museum that's for any museum it's all about how do we archive memory uh and actually the way to you do it and you do it at the time and of course 
if you're writing to a friend, you will probably do it better because it's it's less formal. Uh, now, probably people can also, not that I'm obsessed with the written word, you could, if you're better at it, you could talk straight to camera, you could do anything, but there is something about saving this very unique period because it's already slipping from us. Yeah. I mean, with yeah. the opening up, I don't know if you found that, but... We, yeah, it's it's there, there's kind of there is a couple of pieces that we have taken from this time that are going into the museum's collection that as we as we kind of move forward and we do start to remember this period within the collection, there is a few pieces that will go on display. For example, you know the uh, isolation booklet that the HSC yeah. gives you when you go in for testing. I know is something that we have already got kind of brought into the collection, and we've got an oral history project that. There will be an opportunity to record these stories as you said but it is it's about it's about expressing i guess the feelings and the thoughts and kind of remembering the place that we're coming from and actually emily this kind of this kind of idea reminds me in a, in a very different way to um to something that i remember i remember reading an article that you were speaking about this idea that when you're producing wine you try and express the origins of the place that it comes from and that kind of as a sentiment I think is beautiful but as a, someone who's not a winemaker I was kind of curious what that means how do you capture the essence of a place in a bottle well it's a very good question I think yeah, a lot of winemakers or wine growers are obsessed with sense of place um, because it's um, I don't know if you've all heard about probably yes about the concept of terroir that it involves place, the plant material, the human factor, uh, tradition, climate, obviously. And it's an integration of different uh, factors that um, it's very difficult to replicate to another place. And, and the learning process is very linked to what has happened in certain uh, places. Um, and that, I think, is the great value uh, behind uh, wine and what makes them so unique, especially when, when they're very specific wines from certain places. Um, and I think uh, the human factor involved in, in the terroir concept um, is much more linked to the place than to the actual winemaking. I, I, I believe uh, very strongly that uh, I think wine making is just sort of like a platform where you transform those grapes that are sourced from a place um, into wine um, and the touch that you find in the wine or the essence that you find in the wine has to be related to that site that when you taste it you're sort of driven to that place and and that you you can understand things that happen there or that the wine is a consequence of many years of experience of work and many things more than drinking a wine and to find like the input of the, the person that actually made it and with that I mean in terms of concentration it's like it's like uh, uh, when you make yourself a cup of tea <laughs> you have a tea bag um, making a wine is is a little bit like that you have the grapes uh, in a tank and you start extracting mm. um, from the grapes all the goodness and how you do it how gentle you do it is how respectful you, you're being with the site so you can grab a tea bag and, sort of <laughs> get it in and, out and get right. it made pretty quickly and, and infuse it with something uh, sugar in or whatever um, I think it, <laughs> to get it, the, the right quality and the you have to be very gentle with it and very respectful and then too much oak or too much whatever is just going to intervene with the essence of the site and the, the, the best quality you can get from, from the vineyard. I think the, um, the perfect cup of tea is quite a contentious conversation here and over in Ireland. It's something we, <laughs> yes. we care quite a lot about. Um, and I guess because I'm right in thinking, you have actually worked as a winemaker on three different continents. Like, how does the experience differ on, on that basis? Well, um, when, I was, when I started working, I, I did like a tour around a important wine regions and, and had an experience working there doing vintage. So it was a really good 
good experience to to actually understand i think uh, what i'm what i'm talking about now this how the sense of place not only because of the soil or climate it has so much to do with the, with the people um i think uh, that was a very good way to understand um I think well I worked in in Napa um, in California and then I went to New Zealand and the Kiwis are so relaxed um, and so uh, easygoing and I think uh, you get that feeling I'm so much involved in all the process uh, and very efficient um, doing things properly but quickly you know and and I think I, I got a lot of uh, learning from that and and then I went to Bordeaux to Santa Million which is a very high quality uh, focus there. Uh, I was in a Premier Grand Cru in, in Chateau Canon and just the, the sort of luxury focus quality, everything has to be impeccable. Um, and I think uh, it has um, like an input from how they, they've been doing things uh, generation after generations. Uh, people carry, carry wine in the bloodstream, like they know how to do it, they understand the product in a completely different way. It's so much part of their lifestyle. Like we, we in doing vintage, they, uh, all the harvesters would have breakfast in the chateau and lunch there, and they'd have wine for breakfast. <laughs> it's like, it's uh, such a completely different a way of living wine um, and I mean for lunch they pour a little wine into the soup and uh, so it's just so different to how we see it here you know uh, the consumption of wine in France is around 50 litres per capita and here it's around 14 litres per capita so the wine, the, the perception of wine here is so different to over there. So I think uh, the human factor is so, so strong. And I, I learned a lot of it uh, from, from different places. It sounds, it sounds like it was a fascinating experience. And um, I, 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 I would be someone who'd be quite fond of using wine in soups and sauces. So it's uh, interesting to hear that. And I think we're almost at the end of this evening. Um, but Bridget, I'm going to come to you and try and squeeze in one more story, if that's all right. Just make the most of, make the, most of the hour that we have. Um, you curated the history aspect of an exhibition that we produced a number of years ago called A Woman's Work. And in it, you were talking about um, the world wars and the impact that you know, moments like this and kind of key moments of change can actually have on influencing kind of the way that society goes. And I know at that time you were talking about the evolving role of women in the workplace, but I wonder, looking back on that, if you have, if you have any reflections on, you know, what we might be taking from this experience is what change might be ahead of us. Yeah, uh, so that was really a striking thing when I was doing that exhibition, it was a great exhibition, and it was an exhibition where we were looking at women underrepresented in all kinds of professions like, you know, fire, men, everything. But what struck me was, and I, in a way I was, I didn't like the finding because I like what, you know, Karl Popper called piecemeal engineering. I like humans to rationally and methodically uh, improve their lives. Actually, the things that made most difference to women, I would say even more than the equality legislation of the 70s, which was a massive thing in, the, in what was then the European Commission and in or the European community and in America, equality legislation was huge, but much bigger were these crises, as you say, World War I took, especially World War I, I think that was the biggest mass mobilization of men to date. It took men out of just all the transport men, firemen, all these people, they took them out of the workplace and women had to replace them. And once they'd replaced them, or even footballers, there was no league, so they women footballing and people watched it because they liked football. Now they then, the Football Association then got rid of women immediately after the war. But women having entered the workforce were, they wanted to, you know, they saw the opportunity. That was huge. World War II, again, they stepped into it and at that stage i mean there's some i forget her name but there's a massive computer programmer there was a lot of this is very early stage computers sorry maybe computers isn't even the right word they were what we would call them computer engineers they were women so mm -hmm. it was it, this crisis was a huge opportunity uh and i think that is even going away from women it's the another famous example would obviously be 
uh, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, which Boris Johnson keeps touting now. So he has made the direct link between what we're going through now and the, the 1930s recession. But Franklin Roosevelt would not have been able to do this New Deal, which was this massive sum of money to uh, public money, public works, without the recession. And then the other famous example is Clement Attlee and the, the NHS. And this would not have been done if Britain had not gone through a war. Like, it's like you reach ground zero and you can then remake everything. And obviously that's a really positive message from, from crises and pandemics that we will do something new. And I think everybody is talking about this now and they're saying, can we use this in a good way? What can happen? Um, and I just, I, I, it's, I think it's too early to say, I would like, I, I, none of us thinks the world is so amazing that uh, it cannot be improved and it's you know there's a lot of fear about what this will do and things could get worse and economies will are suffering uh, so if we can find a positive it just I think it has to get very bad in order for change to happen because humans are resistant to change I mean after 2008 after the crash there I remember Christine Lagarde who was then the head of the IMF and she was quite explicit. She said, we need more women in power positions because this was caused by reckless male. She called it male behavior. This, she, and she just said, we need more women. And I, I, you don't necessarily need to attack a male behavior to say that women in positions of authority in, in finances is obviously going to be going to be good. That happened a little bit, but not that much. So we didn't really, after the last crash, it was not as big a behavior change as we wanted to see. Now, I think this is more extreme, it's more global, uh, whether we will see, I think the big things people want is obviously environment is massive. Uh, and can we use this to improve the environment? And people are much more skilled than me are asking these questions. Uh, but all I would say is it will have to get pretty bad or we will revert because that's what we do historically. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I guess just that idea that um, looking at the situation as it is, I think we'll just end by kind of asking, you know, Emily, obviously you guys are still kind of more in the lockdown experience than we are. It's how is Chile, how is your colleagues, how, how is everything over there? Uh, it's a little bit tense at the moment. Um, <laughs> we are, we've been in lockdown since May. Um, in Santiago, I live in I live in Santiago, um, but luckily the wine production is considered an essential uh, product. Uh, so we have been allowed to carry on working, and we have permits, and we can we can go to the winery. And but it, I mean it's it's tough, you know. You go from home to work, and only if you really I only go when I have to taste in the winery. A lot of people. Uh, that in, uh, are in the risk group have to stay at home um, and so being in lockdown for so long I think well you 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 saw the what the reaction when you were let loose um, people sort of uh, you get this sense of and and a lot of people need to go out to work so I there's a, there's a lot going on here I think like in most places but Chile has not come out very well in, in the last year a few months so our numbers are quite high yet so okay well i really do i i wish you all the best and i hope that you know you are moving towards i guess kind of less cases and kind of a safe easing of lockdown in the kind of the weeks weeks ahead because it's kind of i think we're quite far in that kind of journey at this stage and it is it's both exciting and kind of whelming at the same time but um i think that's kind of it's really all we've got time for this evening um like bridget emily thank you both so much for your time i i found this entirely fascinating i still have 20 odd questions for both of you that i'd love to get through i could easily have sat here for hours um but i guess let me just kind of end by saying i really sincerely appreciate you both taking the time so you know thank you very much and good evening thank you very thank much you for the so invitation much. thanks to everyone for listening and it's been really really a great pleasure and I'm going to finish my wine now. Thank you very much. Emily. Lucky you're lucky you that it's wine time. You hear it's lunch time, so ah yeah. no no we I, I have to wait for my wine, wine time. Wine yet. <laughs> and thank you. It's a delicious wine. Cheers, Will. Um, Good. Thank you wine. for listening. Thank you all. Thank you all, everyone.
Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.